Good afternoon, everybody, or in Todd's case, good morning. Um, he's based in Canada, so it's an early start for him for today's webinar. But welcome to today's CPG Masterclass Series webinar with Todd Kirstead, focusing on adaptive golf and the financial um, uh, benefits or impact for your business um, that that will have. Before we do get started, as always, just make sure your microphones are muted. But if you want to keep your screens on so we can see who you are and who's attending, that'd be fantastic. And as always, we will be recording this CPG Masterclass webinar and uploading it onto the hub page afterwards. If you miss anything, you can go on there um, and refer to some notes as well. And then afterwards, after Todd, Todd's finished uh, presenting, we will do a short Q&A. So if you have any questions as and when they come up, put them straight into the chat option uh, in the button below your screens. Um, don't have, you don't have to wait till the end to do that because then I will ask all the questions afterwards and we'll allocate sort of 10, 15 minutes uh, to do that. Once again, thank you for attending today's webinar. I'm Tom Bentley, the Communications and Event Manager for the CPG. So I'd like to welcome you all once again. And without further ado, just want to introduce you to Todd before he gets presenting. Um, in case you're not aware of who he is, uh, based in Canada um, and has done various trick shows on uh, trick shop shows on um, ESPN, TMZ, um, Golf Channel, and actually he's focusing on a slightly different topic due to a particular life experience he had with the US military. So he'll go into a bit more of that um, through the presentation. So Todd, I'd like to hand straight over to you the uh, webinar. Well, thank you, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, we're all going some, through some very difficult times, but I would like to thank the Confederation of Professional Golf for having me a part of the, the CPG Master Series class. Um, today's session, I'm going to be presenting a, fi a financial impact business case study for inclusion and diversity um, in the sport of golf. Um, let's talk about right now, so a little bit of COVID-19. This year in 2020 will be a turning point in the history of mankind, not only because of illness and death, but also because COVID-19 pandemic is offering us a chance to reinvent ourselves. I've been able to travel around the world working with thousands of individuals in adaptive golf situations through the sport and the reality is that many people with disabilities live in isolation every single day. And as a society, it is in the midst of physical distancing measures ourselves, like myself in Canada, like most of you around the world, we are inadvertently introducing ourselves to what many people with disabilities are already confronted with daily. Right now we see employers, educational institutions, communities quickly adapting to this unforeseen situation but on, by not only working remotely, but with online classes and virtual conferences becoming the new normal, like we're in today. The measures we have once found too expensive or problematic to accommodate a person with a disability is simply the way we now do business and we run our daily lives. So golf has faced numerous challenges for many years now. Prior to the pandemic, the industry received many signs and warnings that the sport of golf could fall into crisis if changes were not made. Many golf clubs, both locally, nationally, internationally, will be severely and negative, negatively affected by this pandemic. Many others will rise to the challenge, seize the possible opportunities, and make changes and adapt to our new normal. So the golf industry post COVID-19 needs to look at a new, new opportunities and update business strategies by being creative and innovative. Industry leaders must embrace emerging trends and the new regulations concerning how the game is being played. Anyone in the golf industry who thinks we can return to normal without major adjustments after this pandemic will struggle. There is no nor new normal. We now have to move forward, adapt, innovate, and create a new standard. We now have a choice. We can succumb to the pressures of the pandemic or rise to the challenge, seize new opportunities, and reinvent ourselves and our business. Golf will survive. The golf industry has a great opportunity to promote the benefit of the game and the culture and thrive once this virus has been defeated. So now a little bit about myself. So again, my name is Todd Kearsted. I have been a Canadian PGA member for over 20 years. I've had the privilege of traveling around the world for the last 17 years doing golf entertainment, doing trick shots, helping raise millions of dollars for charities by doing corporate events, charity events, and celebrity events. Now, with that, 
I've had the privilege of spending a lot of time with people in adaptive situations. I've worked with the United States military. I've worked with some incredible individuals through, through adaptive golf. And how that came about was by pure coincidence. I was actually doing and helping out somebody that I saw online, a gentleman by the name of David Windsor down in Florida. We were doing some adaptive golf clinics down there and I was doing my entertainment trick shot show. And I realized that a lot of the shots that I was hitting for pure entertainment value in those 17 years were actually emulating the individuals that was at David's clinic and that was at the James Haley Veterans Hospital just outside of Tampa, Florida. So for a perfect example, I was hitting golf balls blindfolded. I looked out in the audience, there were individuals that were affected by mustard gas in the Vietnam War and lost their sight. I was hitting golf balls swinging with one arm, showing the similarities between the sport of golf and the sport of tennis. I looked out, there were arm amputees. I was standing on one leg hitting golf balls. There were leg amputees. I was hitting golf balls off my knees, double leg amputees. And I was hitting golf balls out of a chair. I looked out, there were individuals that were in a wheelchair situation. So a lot of these shots that I was hitting for these 17 years with traveling around the world doing trick shots and entertainment, with the right audience, it showed me that I was now not only entertaining, but I was inspiring and motivating these individuals. So I was showing them that, yes, maybe you can't play the game of golf the way that you used to, but here is an adaptive way to play the game of golf. So I came back up to Canada and I started a program called Bring Back the Game. And it was doing that, bringing the game of golf back to individuals who thought they've lost it due to their physical or mental situations. Now with that, Toronto was awarded the 2017 Invictus Games. Now the Invictus Games, if you're not aware of them, they were inspired by Prince Harry and in Toronto in 17, we had 17 countries that came to Toronto, 550 athletes, and golf was introduced as one of the sports. So with that, I was part of the organizing committee of the 2017 Invictus Games, and I was a competition supervisor for the sport of golf because there was nobody really doing anything with adaptive golf on a major scale in the Canada or in the Toronto area. So with that, I had the pleasure of meeting 550 wounded veterans from 17 countries and some amazing individuals through the sport of golf and an adaptive golf. I even had the privilege of spending a little bit of time with Prince Harry on the golf course in Toronto, talking to him about the benefits of adaptive golf. Adaptive golf, you know, if you look at the grand scheme of, of the sport of golf, you know, it's only a small little drop in the bucket on timelines. Uh, European is doing amazing worldwide. We've got a worldwide ranking for disabled golf. David's doing some great stuff. Ken June was doing amazing stuff before he passed away. Rich O'Brien, and you have one of the best in the European Disabled Golf Association that I know was speaking uh, a couple of weeks ago on this masterclass. So ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about what we what we're all in this for, I wanna to talk to you about the numbers. So I'm a numbers guy. There's not a lot of studies that are out there with adaptive golf because it's so new. And in Canada, we're just at a tipping point right now where it's gonna to start, to start to explode, but it's now taking off around the world. So not a lot of research done. I'm a numbers guy, so this is what I came up with. And, and the thing that we see all the time when we're talking about adaptive golf is we see a number which is what the United States Census Bureau came up with. And what they came up with, according to the United States Census Bureau, there's approximately 19% of the total US population with some form of disability. Ladies and gentlemen, that's generally one in five people have a disability. Now we can take that US number and put it into Canada, put it in the UK, it's pretty well right across the board and right across the spectrum. So with that study, according to the National Center of Accessibility, another, another um, study was done with the National Center of Accessibility, as well as Clemson University, what they figured out was 10% of individuals with some disability now play golf. 22% of those with disabilities played before their injury, but are not playing now. 
Then there's 35% of individuals with disabilities that are currently not playing, but are very interested in learning. So these are big numbers and these are numbers that I've used on, so not only did I take the US Census Bureau numbers of one in five, then I've taken the National Center of Accessibility as well as Clemson University and broken them, these numbers down even more. So what we've come up with, and you know, I, can, I tried to make it as broad as possible because I know there's people from all around the world that are gonna be watching this. So instead of getting into a specific demographic, what I ended up coming up with was I came up with a population, I did three different populations, and it all depends on what size of, of city that you're, you're in right now. So a population of 25,000 people, 10% of people with playing with some form of disability equates to 475 people. If we have the 22% of those with disabilities that have played before their injury but are not playing now, equates to 1,045 individuals that are currently not playing. Then the next one, 35% of, of individuals with disabilities that are currently not playing but are interested in playing in a population of 25,000 comes up to 1,663 people. Looking at those numbers, we can start to see what a difference that adaptive golf can make in a community of 25,000. Now, if we get into a population of 100,000, we take a look at those same numbers again, 10% of those people, well, now we're looking at 1,900 people that are playing golf with some form of disability. If we take a look at the 22% of those playing that played before their injury, but are now currently not playing, we're looking at now at 4,180. Now for the 35% that are interested in learning how to play the game, now we're jumping up into 6,650 people. Now I did one more population, as I said, because I don't know what demographic the people are or that are watching the show. We're taking a big city now of a million people. This is where the numbers go up. 10% is 19,000 people that are playing the game of golf with a disability. 22% that played before their injury but are not playing now jumps up to 41,000. And then the 35% of people that are currently not playing that are interested, we're looking at 66,500 people. So you can start to see the numbers are getting up there and the opportunity for your facility is pretty big when you start thinking about inclusion and diversity for maybe not only your, your facility, but also your growth of your professional getting into lessons and things like that. So then I took another study. And again, these are all case studies, but they didn't really have anything with adaptive golf in it. So this is a, a study that was with the golf facilities in Canada for 2017. The definitive report of golf facilities and development in Canada. And what we came up with with this study um, it's with a collaboration with the PGA of Canada, the National Golf Foundation, as well as Golf Canada. And with that study, we figured out that there was 5.7 million Canadians who enjoy more than 60 million rounds of golf. So I took those two numbers and I figured out how many rounds approximately were played per person. From there, with taking the previous study of the National Center of Accessibility and Clemson University and combine it with the golf facilities in Canada study and the 5.7 million people and 60 million rounds that are played, if we have a population of 200, or sorry, 25,000, we have 4,997 rounds of golf played by 10% of the people with disabilities. If we get into now the population of 100,000, you can see that we're at almost 20,000 rounds of golf played by people with disabilities. Population of 1 million, we're now jumping into almost 200,000 rounds of golf that is played by individuals with disabilities. Now the numbers that we're gonna take right now is we're gonna look at the 22% of individuals that have played the game but have quit due to physical or mental situations. Now this 
I look at, it's one of the easiest demographics to get back into your golf facility. And the reason why is because we already had them. They already love the game of golf, but maybe they don't know how to play because they're in an adaptive situation. But we always hear grow the game. Let's grow the game. Let's grow junior golf. Let's grow women's golf. And we're trying to get people that we're introducing to the game where these 22%, we already had them. We had them, but we lost them. So if we take a look at a population of 25,000, we are now getting into almost 11,000 rounds of golf that we're missing out on. If we get into a population of 100,000, now we're getting up into 44,000 rounds of golf. And a population of a million, just add another number to that, we're looking at almost 440,000 rounds of golf that we're missing because people don't think they could play the game of golf, but they already love the game. They've already played before. Now getting into the 35%. Now these people are the ones that want to play. They're interested in learning. Population of 25,000, we are looking at almost 17 and a half thousand rounds of golf. Population of 100,000, we're looking at almost 70,000 rounds of golf. And a population of 1 million, you're looking at almost 700 rounds of golf. So you can start to see how much of your, what, your golf course owners or the individuals that are running your, your, your general managers would love to have some of these numbers in here. So now I've taken four studies. I've taken the US Census Bureau, I've taken the National Center of Accessibility, I've taken Clemson University, I've taken the Golf Facilities of Canada. Now I've added one more study in here. And the next study that I added in was another Canadian study, and it was on the economic impact of golf in Canada. It was prepared by the National Allied Golf Association. Now, I've taken these numbers and we've broken them down into how much is spending is done by person. So the golf industry in Canada accounts for about $20 billion in direct spending. I didn't take the whole 20 billion and broke it down, but I broke them up into key um, areas that I thought you'd be interested in. I've broken it down into membership and green fees. I've broken it down into golf equipment, golf apparel, golf related travel by golfers in Canada excluding their own golf courses. So that's anybody that's playing golf inside their own country. And then golf related travel and on course spending outside of Canada by Canadian golfers. So that's anybody that lives in your country that is going to a neighboring country. The next one is capital additions and improvements. So this study of the economic impact of golf found that $50 billion were spent on membership and green fees. 860 million was spent on golf equipment, 1.5 billion was spent on apparel, 4.6 billion was, present, was spent on golf-related travel in Canada, 40 million, or sorry, I'm all messed up right now, 400 million was capital um, improvements at golf courses. So you can start to see the numbers that we done. Now the interesting thing with this study, and this is where I had a little bit of an issue, is the methodology in which this study was, was developed was, it was conducted on the behalf of the NAGA and by Navicom. But the thing about this study is that it focuses on the effective population defined as the population of Canadians who are capable of playing golf, eliminating portions of the population based on age, health, infirmary, or disability. The program that and the individual was that I'm actually trying to really get back out on the golf course. So that was the issue that I had with the study. So they didn't have any numbers and they didn't include individuals with disabilities with the numbers. So what I did was I took the numbers that they had on the previous slide that I just showed you, um, just backing it up a little bit right now. So taking a look at those numbers right now, and then I put them against the numbers that I did with the um, economic studies and I combined them with the Clemson University, the Center of Accessibility, and that those 5.7 million and 60 million rounds. And what I came up with, we're going to get into some financials right here. So the 10% or the 19,000 people with some disability that now play golf, we're looking at in Canada on a population of 1 million people, so in a big city of a million people, 
Membership and green fees are almost $17 million. The golf equipment is over 10 million. The golf apparel is over three, almost 3 million. Disabled Canadian golfers that could be traveling in Canada is 5 million and outside travel outside of country is 15 million and capital additions and improvement at golf courses is as you see 1.3 million. Now that's at a population of a million. Now if we take a look at the 22% of individuals that are, are not playing golf but play golf before their injuries at a population of 1 million you can start to see how these numbers are pretty big. You can start to see why your golf course should be looking at those numbers, should be looking at adaptive golfers, how the equipment manufacturers, how the golf apparel manufacturers, how travel industries, both in country and out of country, and how your own golf course in capital additions and improvements. So we've taken a million people, then we're looking at now the 35% of individuals that are interested in playing so this is money that is sitting out there waiting for you to get and again here we get into some numbers again with the membership and green fees golf equipment golf apparel travel in country travel out of country and capital additions and improvement at golf courses now this is a pretty big number and this is a number that is that is probably pretty tough for you guys to focus on with a population of 1 million so what I've broken it down into then is the population of 25,000, which is, you know, a fairly big sports arena. Um, it's somewhere that's pretty realistic around the a population of your home golf course. So again, taking a look at those numbers of the 10% of individuals that currently play in a population of 25,000, what we're looking at right now is we're looking at there's the numbers right there of 416,000 of memberships and green fees, 267,000 with golf equipment, 71,000 for golf apparel, 125,000 in country travel, 383,000 of out of country travel and $33,000 for your capital additions and improvement at your golf course. Now those 22% of individuals that were playing that quit the game due to their situation. And again, at that 25,000 population, we are looking at, this is the numbers right here. If you go after them, they already love the game of golf, but unfortunately have given it up due to their situation because maybe they don't know how. And that's the demographic that you want to go after because they already love the game. They're already addicted to the game. We're all addicted to the game. Now getting into the, 35% of people that are just waiting for you to go get them. There we go right there. So you can see being, being a business person, being somebody that is, that is trying to, to up their green fees, up their memberships, that's trying to sell equipment, that's trying to sell apparel, that may be in the travel industry, that 25,000 uh, into population, broken it down into people that are wanting to learn, the numbers get pretty high. So you can start to see the value of adaptive golf. You can start to see maybe how you have to think outside of the box. So with having these numbers, I presented these numbers to the National Golf Course Owners Association in Canada back in 2018 as part of their closing keynote speaker and, and, and showing those numbers. And they showed me a lot of interest on what, what do I do and what do we need to do to get our golf courses going again. Now I'm gonna get into another slide right here. This is something that I presented to our PGA of Canada and to our National Golf Course Owners Association. Uh, a couple of months ago, I developed a roadmap for ensuring the sport of golf reflects the diversity of the Canadian community, but it doesn't have to be Canadian, it's any community out there. So one in five US residents have a disability, we need to go after those individuals. So basically the study goes, and I can't really get into the roadmap too much because of will take about another hour to get into but this roadmap is was led by myself in Canada and it is imperative for the success of grow, governing bodies stakeholders and partners who are committed to ensuring that adaptive golf is part of their program and we understand that golf has a positive impact on individuals life it brings health social benefits as a sport helps individuals be the person they can be so the roadmap is intended to provide a consistent approach for really any golf industry to enable access and involvement. And the roadmap looks at issues from perspective of the individual, 
not from the business of golf or the sport of golf. I've had enough dealings and I've interviewed and I've worked with enough individuals with disabilities and I know what they're looking for with adaptive golf. So with that, what I was able to sell to the golf course is, hey, it's going to boost your brand and your credibility. It's going to ensure community in achieving your strategic goals of walk and the talk. It's going to increase, as we saw before, membership in rounds of golf, increase pro shop and F&B sales, improved opportunities for pathways and participation, incentive for sponsorship, sponsorship that you may have never thought of because you haven't really looked at the adaptive uh, world, increased public support. It's always a feel good story. Those pictures that I showed you before with working with individuals and this background picture in the slide, the second you post a picture or something like that, people are drawn to that picture. So the public support is incredible. And that's where the visibility and public image. Um, as well, you're gonna be able to have a more integrative and diverse golf community and you're breaking down barriers in the community. So the big thing about the roadmap that I created is six balls of inclusion. So the six things that we work on is access, attitude, choice, partnership, communication, and strategy. So those are the things and we can dig into those a little bit deeper and I'm gonna put up a slide with all my contact information if you wanna to talk to me about the roadmap. But ladies and gentlemen, I know I've thrown some numbers out there. Um, Hopefully those numbers make sense and I can ask any questions afterwards. Um, but right now with what we are experiencing with, with COVID-19, we're all right now in a isolated situation. That's not, a, not the norm of how we've lived our lives. But ladies and gentlemen, this is how a lot of people with disabilities that are in the adaptive situation are living life on a day-to-day -day basis. So once this pandemic does cease and once we're able to then go back out in the public and live somewhat of a normal life, try and remember the situation that you're in right now because a lot of people are faced in this situation for the rest of their lives. So it helps out with a little bit of empathy and kindness. So Tom, my friend, let's uh, see if there's any questions out there. Excellent. Thank you for that, Todd. I um, hope everybody enjoyed the webinar, first of all. Um, as, as Todd just said, if you've got any questions, post them in the chat option below, and I'll go through some, uh, through some um, with him now. Um, and obviously, Todd, your contact details are on there, so if people do have any further questions about how to take this forward, I'm assuming they can uh, drop you an email in there um, as well. Absolutely. Okay. Um, while waiting for a few questions, I'll get things sort of started. I just did a quick, uh, quick calculation myself, looking at the population of Canada, which is 38 million, just under. Yeah, we're at, we're at 38 million. So just to put, I guess, just to put that into a bit of context as well, in that you think some of the European countries are sort of bordering 40, 50, 60, 70 million. Those financials are actually probably a bit of an underestimate if you relate it to a European context. Now I'd have to have a look at the. Um, the KPMG reports and the most recent one to, to get a proper figure, but just to give you a sort of outline and picture from here. My first question really is, um, we've segmented the market here and there's some serious value in it. If a PGA professional who's listening wants to, first of all, target that segment through marketing activities and that sort of stuff, what is there any practical um, solutions or um, routes you would recommend? Well, the big thing I find, it, it's, it's attitude. The big thing is attitude. Um, I've gone into different golf courses and I've consulted with them, trying to make their on-course experience adaptive, uh, worked at some you know, different things, looking at their properties and what they needed to do to make their golf course adaptive friendly. Um, I had an owner at a golf course that invested a lot of money uh, in first of all, having their, their property, working on some of their bunkering, working on some of their tee decks, um, putting in some wheelchair ramps, um, making a little bit wider door frame going into the pro shop, making sure that the pro shop display was accessible for somebody in a wheelchair, spent a lot of money, had a great initiative, but the first contact that an individual with a disability that came to their golf course, the individual that meted them and greeted them, gave them a negative experience. So all of that money that was spent by that golf course owner to make their facility adaptive friendly, when that individual was faced with a 
less than positive experience turned them away from that property. So the big thing I think is, is attitude. You know, if, if your facility has, an, has the right attitude to be welcoming and accepting to an individual of any physical situation, you've got them. You've got them because they're there for a reason. It's not like they're there to, to get their teeth pulled or, or they get their teeth clean going to the dentist. They want to be at a golf course. And if you are there and if you're giving them a positive environment, whether attitude and experience, you've got them for life. Yeah, and I would probably just comment on that as well in that we're in a situation at the minute in a reintroductory phase of golf in various different countries and people are having to think about how how they adapt to safety measures and social distancing measures so this is a, actually another key area that people could start to think about in the, the way they structure their business the way they um put some certain measures in place to allow adaptive golf to flourish as well as just regular golf exactly and i know tony bennett's doing some incredible things um really all over the world now, predominantly in, in Europe, but, you know, he, he's a, he's a, a, you know, a key stakeholder in this. I know David's on the, on, on the webinar and he's, he's doing some incredible things, not only in Florida and Georgia, but all over the U S um, you know, there's, there's some really good people that you can lean on and, and pick their brains on to, to, to figure out ways of doing this. And, and, and by showing these numbers, hopefully it's given people the opportunity to see really not only a feel good, we all know we should be, doing something for inclusion and diversity. But when, you know, your owner or, or somebody goes, okay, why are we doing this? Now we start to have some numbers that we could then, then play with and say, okay, this is, this is why we really need to do it as well. Um, interesting that you mentioned Tony. Um, he was on actually one of these webinars a few weeks ago as well. Um, just wondering, do you, what sort of relationship does, do you have with Edgar and the work that you do? Well, we're building on it right now. The thing about it is I've kind of been – you know, solo running on my own, you know, picking David, David Winters brain a lot. Um, and, and, you know, Ken June, who, who was incredible in my development as well too. But in Canada, I've been kind of, kind of tackling this on my own because it's been, it's been something that we really need in Canada. Um, we haven't really got into adaptive golf. There's different associations that are running in silos. Um, and I think running in silos, it, it, it's great, but you're not hitting the major masses and, and growing it as a, as a nation or grab, growing it like with the European countries like Tony's doing, you know, he's bringing it to the masses. So um, this COVID has forced me to be very creative in, in doing things to be relevant in the golf industry because um, the, the golf entertainment side of things, I don't know where that's going to be in the next couple of months or the next couple of years because of our um, social distancing and group gatherings. So um, I've tried to be really uh, involved with adaptive golf over the last couple of years when I, or the last couple of months, pardon me, when I've been, you know, stuck at home in self-isolation. And, you know, I've recently um, have spoken to Tony via, via social media. And I think, you know, with having the strong uh, partnerships with the U.S., with David um, and, and Rich O'Brien, and now with Tony, I think, I think we're on the right track. Good, good to hear. A uh, question from Ian, uh, looking specifically at coaching, what sort of advice would you provide to help a pro improve in this area for adaptive golf? Well, the great thing about it is we all have worked with individuals that as an instructor that has had some kind of, we're all different. I, I, I had a hard time uh, adjusting my brain to figure out, and now I use differently abled as opposed to disability. And we're all differently abled. I know, you know, myself and, and you, Tom, are differently abled in the golf swing. Um, we've all worked with individuals that have had bad backs, bad knees, things like that. And it's basically, to me as an instructor, it's so much fun working with somebody that is in a different situation because it forces you to think. It's not a cookie cutter golf approach. But what you've got to do is you've got to have a very... Uh, great rapport with that individual because first of all you need to figure out what their limitations are then you need to adapt your teaching style to work with that individual then you've got to push the envelope with constant communication with that individual to see how far we can push them to get their maximum potential out of their body with the game of golf do you tend to have with coaching, um, is there a bias towards more participation, sort of making sure people retain in the game rather than looking at performance? So say, for example, you get a golfer who um, has a certain disability or restriction or limitation, um, 
are you more focused on making sure they come back to you rather than actually improving them? It's providing the experience. And I look at it, you know, whenever I'm working with somebody that is in a, in a different physical situation, um, I'm, we're utilizing the game of golf as, as an excuse to get them out of the house to give them a sense of purpose. Whenever I'm working with a wounded veteran who is struggling with a psychological injury that is having a hard time getting out of his basement, to me, I wanna provide them with a positive experience. So it's basically giving them the tools to have a positive experience, whatever their situation is. We could be working with somebody that has a stroke and maybe he's 70 years old, but he wants to be able to take his grandson or granddaughter out to the driving range and spend an hour with them hitting five or six golf balls, but experiencing golf with them. So golf to individuals are, um, this, it, it, couldn't, it might not be 18 holes, it might not be nine holes, it might be hitting five shots in a full round of golf, but guess what, the guy got to drive around in a golf cart, have a couple beers and share laughs with three of his friends. We all need to figure out what golf is and what's, and, and golf is different for each individual. So it's providing them the opportunity and the experience for them to enjoy the game. I think you've nailed it on the head there with that, that last bit. Um, interesting, actually, because I'm just looking at a comment from uh, David, and he just says, the interest to learn and relearn the game from the masses is there, it exists. Implementing programs actually impacts the people that you're trying to help as well. It's not just about the business potential. So you've got to think about the sort of the social benefits of playing golf for these people is so important as well as the economic benefits for people who are uh, doing these programs, right? Exactly. And David does a great job of that. He's got a phenomenal mentorship program. So it's not only working with the individual, but it's working with their possible caregivers because a lot of them do need support when they're on the golf course, but also building that mentorship program. It doesn't have to be a, a PGA professional, but providing that mentorship program will then have sustainability in running programs like David's very successful with, with doing in Georgia and Florida. Is there, um, is there a, I think you mentioned sort of like care wise, is there any sort of, um, uh, what's the word, restriction or um, problem in that you have to overcome with the carers as well? So if you have somebody who's perhaps in a wheelchair, for example, you as a coach, have to build a relationship with a pupil, but actually also build a relationship with that, uh, that person's carer. Exactly. So the thing about it is most of the caregivers out there or most of the mentors that are out there generally already have relationships with that individual or is empathetic enough. And I know when I work with a mentorship program, when David works with the mentorship program, when Rich O'Brien works with the mentorship program, um, you know, they're looking at the individual as well to make sure that that individual that is becoming a mentor um, has the empathy. And the empathy is a key word. It is, um, and, and it usually falls into the same bracket. You know, it's great partnering up a wounded veteran with another wounded veteran, but is already part of their rehabilitation. So not only are we providing a golf opportunity for an individual, but now we're giving a mentor a purpose as well too. So we're giving that mentor the opportunity to now get out of the basement again or, 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 or give them a purpose again. And that's where the mentorship program is so strong that if we put the mentors in the right areas, we can then start to develop programs in different regions where I personally can't get to, where, where, where everybody else can't get to, but the mentorship program is thriving. And uh, just to just comment on top of that, just the, another key message from that, and we've had it from a few different webinars already, for those who are coaching is that the importance of attitude, the importance of your personality, um, and making sure that you're not just a good coach, but you're a good people person is so important in this area as well. That's exactly what it is. Again, it's providing the experience. And to me, it's all boils down to attitude. Yeah. And if you have the right attitude, you know, pe people are, people want to play golf. People want to play golf again, but unfortunately, you know, they think they've lost it because it's not the norm. And, and when you start, you know, when I do my entertainment side of things and do my trick shots and I'm hitting golf balls from an elevated tee, um, you can play golf like that. And I'm saying, yeah, because golf, the only thing a golf course worries about and, and I've been to enough golf courses with individuals that are in different situations is they're worrying about pace of play and they're worrying about course conditions. And if you can stress to the individual that is in an adaptive situation that they are going to be looked at under a magnifying glass when they play golf, but they're going to be looked at for those two things, 
And if they can keep up to the pace of play, and if they can make sure that the course conditions are great, there's going to be no problems. And that might mean somebody who's in a wheelchair situation. And I've worked with enough people that are in a wheelchair situation that when we put the ball on the green, I always say if it's inside of 10 feet, it's one putt. If it's outside of 10 feet, it's two putt. And they are happy with that because they're experiencing a golf course again. They're experiencing the camaraderie of a golf course. They're heckling. They're joking. They're having fun with their friends. And that's what golf is all about. Again, it's using golf as an excuse to get somebody out of the house and enjoy their social environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to finish on one more question from me. Um, you could have one piece of advice for everybody listening. I always ask this one just to finish off with. Uh, one piece of advice for everybody that's listening. What would it be based on your experiences and your career? Wow. Um, <laughs> Put the pressure on you. <laughs> you know what? No, it, it's not. It, it's when you, when you live this, when you breathe it every single day, when you, and, and it's not just adaptive golf. When you get a beginner golfer and they get the ball up in the air and hit it a hundred yards, the smile that comes across that person's face. Then when you take somebody who has served their country, who has given you the freedom to do what you do and what you love, and when you give that back to somebody, and now you're, that's my way of saying thank you. When you get somebody who thought they've lost the game of golf due to their physical or mental situations, and you give that back to somebody, it is amazing. And I'm, I'm, I'm an able-bodied person, and, and um, people ask me, why do you do what you do? And the reason why I'm so passionate about adaptive golf and the reason why I love giving back is first of all, I want to give back first of all to our individuals that are served our military. Um, and, and that's a huge goal of mine. But the second thing is my dad got me into the game of golf. My dad got me into the game of golf at a very, very early age. Like most of us probably are, that are on this webinar. My dad passed away 10 years ago. I wish I can hit one more golf ball with my dad. I can't, but if I can give that back to somebody else, that's keeping his memory and his legacy alive in me. And that's really my driving force. If I can give somebody the opportunity to hit a golf ball again or put a smile on somebody's face, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's the best reward in the world. I love that. I love that. Um... That's, I guess that finishes things today just before everybody leaves. Um, but if uh, I think one key takeaway from that is if we can all have the same, same passion and drive and enthusiasm as you, Todd, the golf, uh, golf industry is going to do pretty well out of this. Um, well, you know what? Thank you so much for the opportunity today. Uh, what you guys are doing are, is great in, in you know, these crazy times. You're providing information. You're providing opportunities for people to get their message out there. Um, Plus, thank you for allowing me the platform to get, you know, a different side of golf. And, and yes, the business side of golf, but you can see the empathy side of it hopefully comes through on why I do what I do. But a lot of people also need to, to back it up with the feel-good story with actually hard numbers so they can start programs for themselves and, and start to recognize the value um, in adaptive golf, not only on a, on an empathy side of things, but also on a financial side of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. Completely agree. So, uh, yeah, thank you for, thank you for attending today, Todd. And thank you to everybody else who has attended this webinar. I hope you found it uh, interesting. As I say, if you've missed anything, we we will put this webinar onto the CPG masterclass series hub page afterwards. So you can go back and refer to your notes. Uh, just before you leave tomorrow, we've got another webinar, but it's at uh, 11 o'clock central European time just because of uh, the speakers coming from New Zealand. That's focusing on developing a successful golf tourism strategy. That'll be really interesting um, and give a different scope to the business of golf. And then on Friday, we have building a community of female golfers with Alistair Spink. That's at four o'clock. So hopefully we can see you all there again tomorrow and Friday. Um, lastly, just want to reiterate my thanks to everybody for attending. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're enjoying the series. And finally, thank you to you, Todd, as well. Um, for giving up your time to speak to us um, and the PJ of Canada as well. We really, really appreciate it. Once again, thank you all and hope you have a fantastic evening. Goodbye from me.